April 2025. Two physicists claimed the world's first computer, Archimedes's legendary mechanism, would have jammed within 120 days. Catastrophic failure, they said. It was a bombshell. But 20 years earlier, MIT engineers rebuilt Archimedes' so-called impossible machines and watched them work. Death rays, ship flipping claws, analog computers that predict eclipses with eerie precision. They worked. If the originals never worked, how did the ancients know exactly what to build? Something does not add up. Let's break open the paradox. April 2025, Esteban Sigati sits at a battered desk in Mar del Plata, Argentina, staring at a simulation that shouldn't exist. On his screen, the Antikythera mechanism, every gear mapped in three dimensions, measurements taken from Mike Edmonds scans. Sigati is not an archaeologist. He is a physicist who trusts numbers, not legends. He has spent weeks feeding tolerances into the model, microns of error, degrees of slop, the kind of imprecision any craftsman faces with hand tools. The result is not a slow drift or a minor wobble. It is disaster. The simulation runs. At first, the gears turn smoothly. The dials track the moon and the planets, just like the textbooks promise. Then error creeps in. Tiny misalignments stack up. Triangular teeth, each off by 2.5 degrees, barely matter alone. But when 30 gears mesh, the flaws multiply. By day 120, one third of a year, the mechanism seizes. Gears lock. Teeth slip past each other or grind to a halt. The world's first computer becomes a bronze paperweight. Jam. Sigati emails his co-author, Gustavo Arenas. He writes, The mechanism fails catastrophically after four months, not a gradual loss of accuracy total jam. They double-check the math. They rerun the simulation. Same outcome every time. The numbers are not just inconvenient. They are damning. Modern reconstructions, built in MYT labs or private workshops, work flawlessly. They predict eclipses, track the zodiac, run for years. But those are made with laser-cut gears and digital lathes. The original, as measured, would have died before a single year was out. Sigati cannot shake the question. Why would anyone pour years of labor into a device that fails so quickly? The Antikythera mechanism is not a toy. It is hundreds of hours of work, dozens of parts, expensive bronze. And yet, by the numbers, it could not have done what it was supposed to do. The paradox is brutal. If the only surviving example of this impossible machine never actually worked, what does that say about the people who built it? Did they know it would not last? Was it a display piece, meant to impress, not to function? Or are we missing something fundamental about how it was made, or what happened to it after it sank? Paradox. Sigeti's study lands like a thunderclap. The headlines focus on the 120-day failure. The story behind the numbers is even stranger. If the original could not have worked, why do our reconstructions run perfectly? And if the Greeks did not have the tools to make it function, how did they know what to build in the first place? The evidence points in two directions. Either the ancient engineers built something they did not fully understand, or the device we have recovered is a broken echo of something far more precise. The only thing certain, nothing about the Antikythera mechanism, is as simple as it looks. October 2005, Cambridge, Massachusetts. The roof of MIT's Building 13 becomes a laboratory for ancient warfare. Mark Donahue and Jim Bales haul up 127 mirrors, each one foot square, straight from the hardware store. No TV crew, no spectacle, just engineers and sunlight. Their target is a wooden hull, set at 100 feet, angled to catch the rays. The plan is simple. Align every mirror, wait for the sun to clear the clouds, See if the legend holds. Ten minutes. That's all it takes. The mirrors catch the light, each beam converging. The surface of the wood begins to smoke. The thermometer climbs to 600, then 700, 
then 750 degrees Fahrenheit. A blackened spot grows to a hole. Flames burst through the planks. The hull burns right there on the MIT rooftop. Not a trick, not a fluke. The math checks out. The death ray works. This is not a TV stunt. Donahue and Bales are not chasing ratings. They are chasing Archimedes. For years, experts called the death ray a fantasy. Mythbusters tried, failed, and pronounced it impossible. But their test was stacked to fail. Cloudy skies, moving targets, mirrors set at awkward angles. They assumed the light would scatter and lose power with distance. But sunlight does not fade that way. The physics is clear. Reflected light when focused packs the same punch at 100 feet as it does at 10 feet, if you aim it right. MIT's experiment rewrites the verdict. Under optimal conditions, clear sky, stationary target, perfect alignment, the ancient accounts make sense. Plutarch, Polybius, Livy, all describe Roman ships bursting into flames outside Syracuse. For centuries, historians rolled their eyes. Now the numbers say otherwise. 127 mirrors, 10 minutes, 750 degrees. That is not myth. That is engineering. The MIT team does not stop at one test. They repeat it for the Discovery Channel, for Mythbusters, for anyone who doubts. Each time, the result is the same. Wood burns. The legend stands. The difference is in the details. Conditions matter. The ancient engineers knew it. So did Archimedes. The modern skeptics missed it. The rooftop experiment does more than vindicate a story. It cracks open a pattern. When ancient sources describe machines that sound impossible, maybe the real problem is not the claim. Maybe it is the way we test the claim. The death ray burns a hole through centuries of doubt, leaving a single, searing question. What else did the old engineers get right that we are still getting wrong? Three ancient writers, Polybius, Livy, Plutarch, describe a weapon that sounds like fantasy. The Iron Hand. A giant crane swinging above the city walls of Syracuse, reaching out with a metal claw. The story goes like this. Roman galleys close in, oars thrashing, soldiers packed tight on the decks. Suddenly a hook drops, latches onto the bow, and lifts. The ship rises, tips, then crashes back into the water. Men and timber spill into the harbour. The Romans panic. Plutarch wrote that the Romans began to think they were fighting with the gods. For centuries, historians filed this with the death ray, too outlandish to be real. But in 1999, a BBC team decided to try. They built a replica from scratch. Seven days of work. They followed the old texts, a tall wooden boom, thick rope, a heavy iron grappling hook. The test ship, a full-scale Roman galley replica, waited in the water. The engineers swung the boom, dropped the claw, and caught the bow. The winch creaked as they hauled up. The prow lifted, water poured in, and the ship rolled. In minutes, the galley capsized and sank. The mechanism worked. No trick, no hidden supports. Just pulleys, leverage, and brute force. Discovery Channel ran the same experiment in 2005. Same result. The Iron Hand grabbed the bow, tipped the ship, and dumped its crew. Seven days from blueprint to working weapon. The mathematics are simple. A long lever multiplies force. Ropes and pulleys reduce the weight a single team needs to lift. Archimedes, who wrote the equations for levers, would have known exactly how to make it work. The modern reconstructions do not just match the ancient stories, they make them plausible. A handful of engineers, a week of effort, off-the-shelf hardware. The Roman galley weighed 15 tons, but the mechanism did not care. The claw did not need magic or lost science. It needed a good design and someone stubborn enough to build it. The Iron Hand is not just a party trick, it is psychological warfare. Imagine rowing toward a city and seeing ships vanish, flipped by an invisible force. Plutarch's line is not exaggeration. 
The Romans thought they were fighting the gods because no one else could do what Archimedes did from behind those walls. One more myth, tested and proven. The pattern repeats. Ancient claims dismissed, then rebuilt and shown to work. The Iron Hand flips more than ships, it flips the script on what is possible. If a weapon described in three ancient texts can be rebuilt in a week and sink a galley, what else did the old engineers get right? The answer is not just in the machines of war, it is about the minds that made them, and what they knew that we have forgotten. In 1901, sponge divers working the seabed off Antikythera pulled up a lump of corroded bronze and wood. Nobody realized what they had found. For decades, the gears sat in a museum drawer, mistaken for a jumble of clockwork centuries out of place. Then the X-rays came, over 30 gears, teeth meshed in impossible ways, dials and inscriptions that mapped the sky. The Antikythera mechanism was not just old, it was a machine no one believed could exist that early. First century BC, a thousand years before anything like it shows up again. The device does more than count days, it tracks the cycles of the moon, predicts eclipses, and maps the paths of the known planets through the zodiac. All with bronze gears, hand cut and fitted by craftsmen who had no magnifying glasses, no steel tools, no lathes. Every rotation is a calculation. The front dial shows the solar year and zodiac. The back reveals the metonic cycle, 19 years, 235 lunar months. There is even a dial for the four-year Olympiad cycle. Nothing this complex appears again until medieval clockmakers in Europe. Tony Freeth, a physicist at University College London, spent years decoding the mechanism. He calls it almost unbelievable in its brilliance. Freeth's team, along with Mike Edmonds, used modern imaging, reflectance transformation, and micro CT scans to peer inside the corroded mass. They mapped every gear, every inscription, what emerged was an analog computer built 2,000 years before the word computer existed. The precision of the gear ratios is not an accident. They match astronomical cycles, not just roughly, but with accuracy that rivals modern mechanical clocks. The device does not just show the phases of the moon. It models the moon's varying speed, its so-called anomaly, using a pin and slot mechanism. That detail stunned engineers, it is a feature you would expect from a watchmaker in Geneva, not a Greek craftsman in 100 BC. Modern reconstructions, built from the scans and ancient texts, work. They run smoothly, turning out eclipse dates and celestial positions just as the original would have. Freeth's replica, assembled gear by gear, predicts solar eclipses with a twist of a crank. The zodiac dial advances, the pointers align, and the mechanism spits out the date of the next eclipse. No batteries, no electronics, just bronze, math, and patience. It works. The Antikythera mechanism is not a one-off marvel. Its complexity hints at a tradition, a school of engineering now lost. Freeth puts it plainly. It is like finding a jet engine in King Tut's tomb. The device should not exist, but it does. The brilliance is not just in the design, it is in the fact that someone, somewhere, knew how to make it work. Before the doubts about precision, before the questions of lost knowledge, the evidence is right here. A machine that turns the sky into numbers and numbers back into predictions. The Greeks did not just imagine the cosmos, they built it, gear by gear, into bronze. October 2006 Archaeologists in Olbia, Sardinia, dig through layers of ancient debris and pull out a fragment that should not exist. It is a single gear, 43 millimeters across, teeth still sharp, made not of bronze but of brass. That alone is a shock. Brass was rare in the ancient world. It was harder to make than bronze, and it demanded precise control over zinc and copper. But here it is buried with ceramics from the late 3rd century BC or early 2nd century BC. That is at least a century before the Antikythera mechanism. Giovanni Pastore at the University of Bari 
gets the first close look. He runs scanning electron microscopy, SEM, on the metal. The results are clear. This is not a rough, primitive piece. The alloy is purer, and the teeth are cut with a precision that rivals anything from Antikythera. Pastore calls it more advanced than the gears from the famous wreck. He points to the tooth profile, the tight tolerances, the brass composition. Nothing like this should have existed in the Mediterranean at that time. One gear, no inscriptions, no mechanism to reconstruct. But it throws the timeline into chaos. If the Olbia gear is older and more advanced, the Antikythera mechanism might not be the apex of ancient engineering. It could be a copy made by craftsmen who only half understood the original. The possibility hangs in the air. What if the best devices did not survive? What if the artifact in the Athens Museum is just the last flawed echo of a lost tradition? The evidence is thin, a single gear, a handful of data, but it is enough to make the official story sweat. In a dim library in Constantinople, late in the 19th century, Johann Ludwig Heiberg leaned over a battered prayer book and saw Greek letters ghosting beneath the ink. The parchment had been scraped clean in the 13th century. Archimedes's mathematics were erased to make room for Christian prayers. Centuries of knowledge, gone with a knife and a new coat of ink. Heiberg realized what he was seeing. Lost treatises overwritten and nearly invisible, containing ideas we would not rediscover for almost 2,000 years. Among the vanished works, scholars hunted one title in particular, a book called On Sphere Making. Pappus of Alexandria referenced it. He hinted it held the secrets of building mechanical models of the heavens. No copy has ever surfaced. What is left are fragments, hints of a lost tradition. Cicero wrote about planetariums built by Archimedes and carried off to Rome by Marcellus after the siege. No one knows what happened to them. The bronze would have been worth a fortune. It was easily melted down when fashion or fortune changed. Historian Alexander Jones at NYU points out, when a device broke, its metal vanished too. The Antikythera mechanism survived only because it sank to the bottom of the sea. But the destruction was not just physical. The palimpsest shows knowledge can disappear by human choice. Pages were scraped, overwritten, forgotten. And even when the bronze survives, time does its own work. Aristides Vulgaris argues that numbers from modern scans are a trap. 2,000 years of corrosion twist the gears and blur the tolerances. The original precision, if it ever existed, is gone. We are measuring damage, not design. The real loss is not just a machine. It is the tradition behind it. Workshops, techniques, instructions erased by economics, by war, by the simple need for parchment. What survives is a puzzle with half the pieces missing and the rules for assembly deliberately thrown away. Here is the twist. Every time a technology we once called impossible gets rebuilt, the story of what is truly lost grows deeper. Today, new finds keep surfacing. Another gear, a scrap of parchment, a hidden code beneath the prayers. The real limits are not ancient skill, they are what we have forgotten to look for. The next breakthrough could be rusting at the bottom of the sea. What do you think we are still missing? <laughs>